And with us are an esteemed panel. I'm going to introduce them here to my left is Amber Bond. She is the executive vice president and COO of the African American Alliance of CDFIs. Um, also is Samantha Tweedy. Um, she is the chief executive officer of the Black Economic Alliance. And finally, Damon Hewitt, who is the president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. I always get my tongue twisted around the organization. <laughs> Lawyers <laughs> Committee. You got Thank you. Um, and we are going to, I guess, dive right in. I think um, many people in this room would probably agree with the statement that there is a lot that has changed between 2022 and 2023. And certainly that is also true since the Joint Center's last summit. Um, and we're going to try to explore that a, a, a bit. Um, I will start with a question to the entire panel. Certainly any of you should feel free to weigh in one at a time, but feel free to weigh in. I wonder if um, each of you could introduce yourselves or at least talk a little bit about the work that you and your organization do and how, I guess, the conversation or sort of maybe even the list of concerns around matters of racial equity differ this year than let's say last year or previous. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Damon Hewitt, President of the Lawyers Committee once again. Our organization was founded 60 years ago in 1963 at the height of the Civil Rights Movement, just less than two weeks after Mega Evers was assassinated and about two months before the March on Washington. For anybody who was alive or was a student of history uh, of that time, you know that was a hot summer, uh, before the hot summer, before the long hot summers. And so, Today, our organization, we leverage the private bar and doing pro bono work on civil rights. We have leveraged 1.3 million pro bono hours from law firms in the last decade. Over the last two decades, over a billion dollars worth of pro bono time when you adjust for inflation, which you always do. Uh, but our mission, contemporary mission, is to ensure that black people and other communities of color have the voice, the opportunity, and the power to ensure that the promises of democracy are real. Otherwise, they're just promises on paper. Now, they're trying to silence our voices, they're trying to limit our opportunities, and they are trying to completely kneecap our power. So what's different today than what was true a year ago for this forum is, is essentially everything and nothing. I would say the law has not actually changed. And we'll talk about that in more detail hopefully later. The law actually hasn't changed. In the affirmative action cases, which we litigated and argued before the U.S. Supreme Court after nine years of litigation in the UNC and Harvard cases, the court did not overrule precedent. At least that's what they told us. They underruled the precedent. They took the law and put it in knots and misapplied it and frankly misinterpreted it, intentionally so, without actually changing the legal standard. All the attacks were seen on DEI and the corporate sphere the law of discrimination in employment has not changed. The law of non-discrimination in contracting has not changed. What has changed is the political environment. What has changed is the ferocity. Another thing I say is we've also had some wins over the last year. People did not expect to see the win in the voting rights case that my friends at LDF litigated, the Alabama redistricting case, didn't expect to see that. People didn't expect to see some of the things we've seen in terms of certain people being elected around the country. Although we're nonpartisan, we pay attention to what happens with elections because we convene the Election Protection Coalition, which some of you are part of. So what, what, again, what's changed is the political environment and the ferocity of attack. What's changed is the courts had already been politicized, but now they've been weaponized. And they are being used to the nth degree. But here's the thing. A lot of the lawsuits we're talking about that we're seeing weren't filed yesterday. They weren't filed after the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action. They were actually filed a few years ago. There's another case regarding affirmative action in higher ed at UT Austin, University of Texas at Austin. And that case was filed three years ago this summer, three years ago. We're gonna litigate that case too because just like UNC and Harvard, we represent black and brown students there as well. So the attacks, frankly, have always been coming. Ever since there's been affirmative action, there have been efforts to challenge it. Ever since there have been elections in this country, there's been racial discrimination in elections. Ever since there have been public schools in this country, there's been discrimination in public schools. 
So in some ways, nothing has changed, but in other ways, it feels like everything has. Good afternoon. My name is Samantha Tweedy. I'm the CEO of the Black Economic Alliance and just want to say a huge thank you to the Joint Center, to Jessica Fulton, somewhere around here, uh, and to Paul Thornell just for the leadership, the work, the partnership. Uh, BEA partners with Joint Center on a number of things, including the appointments work that you were listening to uh, a few moments ago. So just gratitude for bringing everyone together today and for uh, setting us all up in this conversation. The Black Economic Alliance, uh, quite differently from the Lawyers Committee, is a very new organization relatively. We are just celebrating five years this year. And BEA was formed by an alliance of black business leaders and aligned advocates in recognition of the fact that despite so much of the progress that had been made for black folks across this country, that when it came to economic progress, there was still so much work to do and that there was opportunity for the business leadership to work alongside civil rights leaders, religious leaders, activists, et cetera, to be able to advance the needle there. And so BEA is laser focused on advancing work, wages, and wealth across the black community. And we do that through our foundation that creates research and curates solutions for public and private sector leaders, our uh, 501c4 that advances policy, and then we have a PAC that endorses and uh, supports candidates who are working on a work wages wealth agenda. And so when we think about this year uniquely, if you look at the challenges, the attacks, litigation, the uh, 13 states attorneys general letters to Fortune 500 companies saying cease and desist or else we're coming after you, the litigation brought against the Fearless Fund, the black VC around discrimination because they're focused on investing in black women entrepreneurs, et cetera. When you look at all of those, what is clear is that they are direct attacks on the pathways to economic progress that actually we're starting to gain some ground. And so yes, we think about looking at, out at our economic prospects and recognizing that the housing disparities are as large and larger than they were during Jim Crow or that you know, the way that the wealth gap still exists in this country harkens back to the percentage of wealth that we owned when the Emancipation Proclamation came down. But specifically around what has changed this year, it is that those areas where we had actually built pathways in corporate America, in black entrepreneurship, et cetera, that were working in higher education, that now those are directly under attack. And so as Damon says, the law hasn't changed, right? But the narrative has changed and how folks are understanding what can and can't happen in the wake of the affirmative action suit and all this litigation has dramatically changed. And so a lot of what we, have been working on at BEA that we're gonna talk about today is about how we help shape and shift that understanding and narrative so that the context that exists, that undergirds this litigation, that undergirds all of this work is actually telling the right story about what is possible. Hi, uh, and my name is Amber Bond. And again, I'm the EVP and COO of the African American Alliance of CDFI CEOs. I mean, we're an <laughs> intermediary, so it wouldn't be right if we had an extremely long name. <laughs> Um, and there wasn't an acronym that you'd have to learn in addition to the long name, so we'll just say the Alliance for short. Um, and so as, as I mentioned, we're an intermediary that serves black-led CDFIs, and I don't always take for granted or assume that everyone knows what a CDFI is. So just to add another acronym to your list, it's a community development financial institution. So these are uh, financial services institutions that exist, mostly nonprofit, but they are uh, hyper mission focused. So they look to support folks that are low income, uh, minorities, women, and other underserved populations. And so many times they are a, I hate to use the word or the term last resort opportunity for underserved entrepreneurs and for folks that are uh, pursuing affordable housing, but surely they are the best option. So we can often offer below market rates, technical assistance, and other training opportunities and support. And what we found is statistically that black-led CDFIs suffer from a lot of the same statistics that black communities suffer from in terms of access to capital, network, all the things that really contribute to an organization or business's success. And so the Alliance exists, it's the first organization specifically focused on black-led CDFIs and becoming a, a source and, and resource to them for capital, the technical assistance for the leaders of those organizations, and a shared voice. We spend a great deal of our time in advocacy um, at the national level focused on really anything and everything, you can go to our website and you'll see we talk a lot. We <laughs> release um, reactions, white papers, sign-on letters, 
anything that will elevate uh, the issues that affect our communities, but also um, just the additional hardships that are faced by the CEOs trying to do the work within our communities. Um, and, and so everything and nothing was like the perfect <laughs> term, if I can borrow that, uh, because in addition to what's already been shared, and those are things that we are, are of course, um, hyper-focused on as well, I'll say just some of the changes. You know, the CDFI fund is in the process of releasing um, changes in, in its application process. We've been fighting for a CRA reform. I mean, there are just a, a myriad of, of issues that, you know, the fight continues. But I would say um, maybe another added layer would be the level of accountability. Uh, as we've seen um, post-2020, um, in addition to COVID and the, the social unrest as it's been coined. I think there's a, a call for us to stand and, and deliver a higher level of accountability, especially for some of those corporate promises that have been made. I think it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars that was committed, but we've only seen, I wanna say five billion of that actually hit the street. And so we've certainly taken a stance that if no one else will, we're going to hold these corporate organizations accountable to um, put their money where their mouth was um, in terms of the administration and, and um, and putting this money into the hands of black communities. Um, and then the other would just be, of course, you know, everything green, right? Um, in Inflation Reduction Act, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, and preparing our communities for this um, green revolution, if we can call it. Thank you. Um, I guess let's dive in. David, you started with a really important point among the larger things that have happened this year. Um, I think without question is the Supreme Court decision in the case of the students for fair admissions versus Harvard and the University of North Carolina cases. Um, obviously the MSPB came down and I believe it was June, uh, in June. Um, I think there was a lot of commentary. You know, there were a lot of, um, uh, I think predictions um, about what it would mean. And I, I wonder if you could talk with us just a little bit about what the outcome in those cases really mean from your perspective in particular. I think your point about little has changed and everything has changed, as you said, is a really brilliant way of putting it. Um, the law itself has not changed. How it is being interpreted has. Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about what the outcome in those cases probably really means and what you are seeing, um, I guess, that feels Sure. So, how do you? A smart person once said, a, uh, "If you're really smart, you make complicated things seem simple, not simple things seem complicated." So I'll try to not do the latter. So, the the decision essentially held that did did not hold that race could never be a factor in college admissions, but it set up this kind of gauntlet of criteria and standards that is not a linear checklist, and some of which are intentions. So, for example. Well, if you consider race, you have to have an articulable goal, but that goal better not be too tight, has to be flexible. Um, if you consider race, it, uh, we say it was a plus factor, say, well, you can't consider race as a negative, and here race was a negative. Well, if you consider race, it cannot be uh, under-inclusive, because you focus on blacks and natives and, and, and brown people, but what about South Asian people? What about other people? But then you can't consider race in a way that's over-inclusive, because if you consider black people, now you remember, you gotta forgive this analogy, Remember the question used to be 20, 30 years ago, should Bill Cosby's kids benefit from affirmative action, remember that? And then people said, should P. Diddy's kids benefit? Like, that, that's, what they, that's what that whole over-inclusive thing means, right? So all these kind of weird standards, at a practical level, Janelle, what it really means is that colleges and universities are confused as they could possibly be. <laughs> <laughs> and they are doing, frankly, what they've been doing for 20 years, so I actually, have been, you know, humbly played a role as a junior lawyer, then growing up to more senior uh, ED, and all of the affirmative action cases have gone up to the Supreme Court in the last 20 years. Up until now, we've been winning all the cases. The, the Gruder case in Michigan, the Fisher one case uh, from UT Austin a decade ago, Fisher two. We had saves in the courts, but during their sabotage on campus. We saw all this kind of constriction. Well, it's going to fall, so we better change our policies. Well, it's, it's, we're going to lose, so we better not do much. And now there's real, real constriction. I will say this. I do have a kernel of hope, a negative possibility. 
because the court didn't fully overrule, totally overrule that race can't be considered at all, it just made it really difficult in the gauntlet of how you actually get there. Um, there's still some possibility, but most universities are doing uh, what you may even consider race-blind admissions, not most, but many, I would say. But some are leaning into the particular provision in a decision, the majority opinion, that I think actually makes some sense. Just Chief Justice Roberts wrote that, as all parties agree, nothing in this opinion prohibits universities from asking students to talk about their experiences with race, whether it be discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise. So when you look at when it's, we talk about minority contracting programs and there's been a lawsuit against the Small Business Administration's 8A program, uh, there are many, many billions of dollars going to black-owned businesses because of that program. Now there's an injunction against the program and it's rebuttable presumption that if you're a black, brown, native business over, owner that you're presumptively disadvantaged. We know that to be factually true in almost every circumstance, right? But the rebuttable presumption has been struck down. Now what business owners have to do in that program under the current rules is to write a disadvantaged narrative. In some ways, th that feels like really cumbersome. It's like, why do I have to tell you the facts that are clear on their face? Why do I have to go through something that feels like proctology just to explain to you that I've suffered discrimination and I've been blocked out opportunities? And how can I tell you when the invisible hands lock me out without me even knowing it? That's really tough, right? But it does lean into that piece that's left, that negative possibility in the affirmative action decision of talk about your experience with race, discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise. So what we're saying as a, at a practical level is colleges, you better ask every applicant to talk about not just race and racism and diversity, but tell your whole story. Because at the end of the day, to me, affirmative action wasn't checking a box so there are a few black slots with a ceiling. It's about seeing all of us for our full and beautiful selves. If I am the valedictorian of, of a high school and I'm class president and it turns out I'm a black man or a black, a black boy or black girl and I'm one of the few if maybe the only in my graduating class of hundreds, that tells you something about who I am. And frankly, if I'm a white student who's a star on the, on the football team and is also a valedictorian and class president and one of the few white students at a majority black school, not many of those folks, that tells you something about who someone is as well. Race matters in context. You cannot divorce race and identity and ethnicity from somebody's accomplishments. So we say colleges ask students and we tell students and business owners and advocates, talk about it. Do not let them silence us because the moment they start silencing us, that narrative that, that Sam talks about, we are implicit, uh, or complicit rather, in allowing that narrative to change. provides a pretty natural segue. I wanted to ask you, Amber, about, um, I guess, the sort of things that are top of mind for you this year. In particular, I guess I'm very curious about the challenges facing CBFIs or black-led CBFIs and black-led organizations and companies. Um, and Damon wisely mentioned the issues inside the 8A program. I wonder if you could maybe start just by helping people to understand what the 8A program is and why it matters, but I guess what else is on sort of, what is top of mind for you this year um, and what you're hearing from your members? So I, I'd actually like to spend some time talking about 7A if that's okay. Um, <laughs> so CDFIs um, are only allowed to participate in the 7A program. Um, and that is on the credit enhancement side. So they're able to pursue small business loan guarantees through uh, 7A. Uh, and we've been kind of at the forefront of fighting for that program, which has historically been a, uh, a pilot. It's called the Community Advantage Program to become permanent. Um, and it's really an important tool because um, that small business loan guarantee essentially allows a CDFI to take um, a small business owner that let's say has been in business for less than two years or does not have sufficient collateral to fully secure a loan or has, um, you know, typically they require a 10% equity investment into a transaction and maybe they don't have quite that full 10%. So all these areas where um, a person would typically be kicked out of the credit box, uh, these are areas where they can use a guarantee to help de-risk 
the transaction, if you will, so they could get, that CDFI could get up to, you know, 80% guarantee on the loan, which makes it a less risky transaction, which also helps their, in the end, helps their balance sheet. And then they could ultimately sell those loans in the secondary market, so it helps their liquidity and has all kinds of great benefits. Um, and so those types of, of credit enhancements at a, you know, a federal program level are really important. Uh, they help um, these CDFIs to deploy that capital, and it also helps them to attract additional investments because once those guarantees are applied against their loan portfolio, they become more attractive to investors in general. So it just kind of helps the entire cycle of deployment from investments into the CDFI to deployment out. Um, and so we, we have spent a lot of time talking with the folks at, at SBA about ways that they could improve that program because it did have some, I mean, what program doesn't have some biases that are affecting how it's administered, but they were really underperforming in terms of reaching uh, the black community. It was something like 2% uh, of those guarantees were coming to black owned businesses. And we kind of held their foot to the fire to say, why is it? Let's talk about some of the criteria that's really impacting their CDFIs or black led CDFIs ability to use um, those guarantees or the number of black led CDFIs that were even participating to begin with because of some of the, the additional restrictions and compliance. Uh, that made it just, you know, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. You'd spend more time applying for the guarantee, focused on the, the, the back end reporting, and it just didn't make it worth it for smaller dollar size loans. Uh, most black businesses, especially in their early stages, are looking for micro loans. And so if you spend just as much time underwriting and closing a micro loan as you do a, a, you know, a $300,000 loan, that, you know, you're only suffering on the cost side. And then if you're doing, you know, a rate that's below market, you're, you're not able to recoup on the other end in terms of um, interest income. So um, those type of programs are just e extremely important to CDFIs and we wanna make sure that they continue to get the attention that's needed. And the 7A program, is it actively, um, I guess, under threat or it simply is in need of strengthening from your point of view? Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily under threat, but it had just been renewed as a pilot program and wasn't on the horizon for it to become permanent. And so that was the fight for us to say, hey, we really want CDFIs to continue to be at the table to use this product. Uh, and we want to see it become permanent legislation so that it's not, you know, we're not holding our breath every couple years to make sure that it's, it's renewed and we can continue to use it. Well, um, I guess, Samantha, I will ask sort of a very similar question um, to you, which I, I am very curious about what you're hearing from your coalition members in terms of top concerns. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. I'm very curious what you're hearing from, from your members or I guess from inside the business world um, in terms of top concerns this year and perhaps more historic concerns that have remained with us or are pressing once again. So before the Supreme Court affirmative action decision even came down, you know, we were all anticipating what we knew would be the definition of the chilling effect, right? If it went the way that it did, which was to say that even though the case did not discuss, engage, relate to the private sector, to corporate diversity, uh, to private sector diversity initiatives, that there was great anticipation that folks would start trying to read the tea leaves to see what this might mean for them. And we were in conversation with business leaders, with corporate lawyers, immedia immediately after the decision came down, and what we heard was exactly that, that you know, folks were calling their counsel and asking, can I still run this mentorship program? Can I still run this pipeline program? Can I still give a grant to a nonprofit organization that is focused on black and brown students, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the reality of what happened was that before folks could even finish those conversations in that immediate moment of the chilling effect, that this very well organized, very well funded effort to claw back all of our pathways to economic advancement started hitting all across the spectrum. You know, it was weeks later that the litigation was that the, excuse me, the, the, the state attorneys general, 13 Republicans sent the letters to Fortune 500 companies. Weeks later that the litigation was brought uh, by the same organization that brought the affirmative action case to the fearless fund to say, venture capital, stop, don't invest in focus on black women entrepreneurs in this way. 
And, and to this narrative point, what happens is that the headlines all tell one story. So for example, if you look at the details of the litigation brought against the Fearless Fund, what's actually at issue in that litigation is a grant program that the Fearless Fund is running, right? It is not talking at the crux of that case about the venture capital investments that are being made, but that is not where the headlines lie. And so what we quickly recognized was that we needed to be able to insert a different public narrative into the sphere to actually influence how folks were understanding what was happening and to contradict this sense, this growing sense that the attacks that were coming from all sides were really representative of where the country was. And so BEA engaged with the Harris Poll, and this was in August, so this was right in the midst of this, to ask the question, what does the American public think about whether corporate America should reflect the racial diversity of this country? And resoundingly across the board, what we got back was that yes, the American public believes that corporate America should reflect the racial diversity of this country. And importantly, at nearly 80% that folks were saying companies should be taking active steps to ensure that they reflect the racial diversity of this country, right? And what are those active steps? Those are the mentorship programs, those are the pipeline programs, right? Those are the investment uh, in, in nonprofits supporting black and brown students. And when we looked at the data and we broke it down, what we recognized immediately was that this included 75% of white Americans and 67% of Republicans and 80% of Americans across every generational line. And so what that said to us loud and clear was that as well-organized, well-funded, uh, and aggressive as the efforts are against us, that they're really out of step with the American people and they're out of step with what folks believe should be happening. And that paired with the fact that we're looking out at a future where racial diversity in business has never been more important to business's bottom line, right? You look at the $350 billion, or trillion, excuse me, the $3.5 the trillion consumer spend that will represent the black and Latino population. When you look at the 36% of added profitability that companies with diverse executive teams have, there's no greater understanding at what's at the root of racial diversity in business than what's at the root of business, right? Which is growth, opportunity, and profitability. And so the conversation that we wanna make sure that we're having with everyone from public policy leaders to private sector leaders is again about what's behind this, what's the why here? And I think there is an interesting toggle between when we're thinking about reinforcing businesses' commitments from 2020, recognizing what was at the root of so many of those, and how do we actually shift a different conversation to companies understanding why it is that they want for themselves, for their business, to be advancing racial diversity within their ranks and within their companies and their executive teams. I just want to say, first off, I'm learning some things um, here today. I, I'm not sure if everybody sees me over here scribbling, but I'm <laughs> writing down like story ideas and little thoughts. Anyway, um, I wanted, in a, in a way, this is sort of connected your your point about um, the need to, I think, really present uh, sort of some facts that would seem to contradict the the sort of sweep of litigation that seems like a semi-coordinated attack on civil rights um, policies and I guess practices programs across the country. Uh, it, it is a revelation to me, the Harris polling data that you mentioned that this is actually out of step with what the average American thinks, expects, or wants um, from corporate America or for that matter the government. That is revelatory. <laughs> so. I wondered if I can, and I hope this isn't too much of an imposition, but David, you mentioned something before we came on stage that I think um, is a, a, an important follow on the points that were just made. You described this sort of wave of litigation as inorganic, and I wondered if you could explain um, why you describe um, these many suits, including a suit that's been mentioned here against the Fearless Fund, as inorganic. What made you think that way? Sure. Well, first of all, they a lot of this litigation and these anti-woke and anti-diversity efforts have common sources of funding and a common, you know, a brain trust, so to speak, or a stem cell. They've been growing like more like a fungus, frankly, really. But the same person, Ed Blum, who lost, he financed and lost 
the uh, case of Abigail Fisher versus UT Austin over a decade ago, he's, he's the one who financed and created Students for Fair Admissions, the kind of syndically named organization that successfully sued UNC and Harvard. He's also the same person who financed a decade ago the Supreme Court case Shelby County versus Holder, which gutted the heart of the Voting Rights Act. So this, this person is not about, well, his own version of fairness and diversity. He's anti-us, period. He's anti-opportunity. He's anti-anything that has to do with racial justice or reckoning, what have you. And honestly, he's been at this for a while, but it's almost as if what felt like a, a, a movement moment and an American awakening on racial consciousness seemed to give him fuel to, to, to keep fighting, ironically. It's not organic because when you hear about these book bans and curriculum bans, and there's you know some litigation even we're suing in Oklahoma where teachers fear that they can't teach about the Tulsa Race Massacre or the Trail of Tears. Factual, horrific, violence, genocide that happened in this country. People are being told just that they can't even talk about that in places like Oklahoma. But if you track all the book bans, the, both the books that are being banned and the people perpetrating these efforts, that's highly coordinated. That's not organic, like parents just, you know, have a, white parents have an uprising around the country. They took the Glenn Youngkin strategy from Virginia and they're leveraging it. And they started leveraging it ahead of what? The 2024 election to mobilize the base. That's how they're trying to take away our power. And they're trying to rewrite it, Sam, I'm so glad you brought up narrative. They're trying to rewrite the narrative. And they're also using weapons of mass distraction to make us fight on all these different fronts so that we miss where the money is going with the CDFIs, so that we miss what's happening on Capitol Hill, so that they can take over all power. If you think about there are a lot of things that slavery, sharecropping, Jim Crow, and these efforts all have in common. A lot of things they have in common, but one thing I want you to think about is the effort, the, 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 the racialized fear, the manufactured sense of grievance about being overtaken and overcome because they know demographics and time are not on their side. And when I say they, I don't mean white people. I mean people who hate diversity, people who are anti-black, people who don't see us as fully human, people who don't see us as full, the full stakeholders we are in this society. That's exactly what and who I mean. So there's nothing organic about any of this. This is all orchestrated. You know, Hillary Clinton talked about the vast right-wing conspiracy. I don't know what the contemporary term is, uh, but the fix has been in for quite some time. And I do believe, just like the Harris Poll showed, we know that our Asian American friends, uh, uh, AAJC, tell us that their polling shows that the majority of Asian Americans support affirmative action as well, right? So I believe we got more, not just more black people, brown people, but more people of conscience, more people who are willing to center racial equity, more people who are willing to see their fellow brother and sister, regardless of race or ethnicity, rise instead of knowing or thinking you gotta have the foot on the neck in order for you to be able to stand up. That's what they're afraid of. They're afraid of the same thing they were afraid of in the 1960s, a multiracial, interfaith, and multi-generational coalition. The same coalitions that took to the streets in the 60s, same coalitions that were marching in the streets in the last decade. They're afraid of that awakening and that kind of coalition forming. And that's, that's, that's why I think we will ultimately prevail. And can I just add, we also have the data on our side now. <laughs> right, when, when folks were building the corporate ladders and pathways and diversity programs, there was no data to demonstrate what that was gonna mean for business, right? And right now what we are allowing is this victory of this zero sum game story, that it is us versus them, that if we advance economically as black folks that nobody else can, but we again have the data on our side, right? And this is not what changed this year, but this is what changed just over the last few years where we have data out of McKinsey, <laughs> we have data out of city, right? Demonstrating that the racial economic disparities in this country from housing to health to jobs to entrepreneurship have cost not the black economy, but the entire US American economy, $16 trillion, right? 
And so I think another place where we just have to make sure that we are resetting the narrative is to say, you can go out and act like my gain is your loss, but actually all of the data says that that is not true and that by growing the black economy, by growing our power, by growing our place, the entire country benefits in reality and in numbers. It's such a valid point and I actually was hoping if I could to ask you a question sort of related to this, Amber. I think in a moment where it can feel like so much is um, at risk, right? Um, you mentioned uh, the decimation of the sort of heart and teeth of the Voting Rights Act. Um, I think most people can understand what that means and, and certainly there we've, you know, since this happened in 2013, we've had a lot of time to see exactly how that's been deployed and used. I think it, because of that, it can, I, I think it can feel like there are all these urgent things and issues like access to capital and whether or not there are thriving um, black owned businesses in the United States can almost feel esoteric sometimes to people or maybe like a third tier issue or something, right? Like we'll get to that when we, you know, are able to vote and have safe housing or something, right? Yeah, but, right. <laughs> right. Um, right. And so I wondered if you could, Amber, try to help the audience just out of an abundance of caution because one of the things I will tell you all that really shocked me is I've been, I'm reporting a story right now about the Fearless Fund mm -hmm. lawsuit. And one of the things that really stood out to me that without question, this is US government data, that businesses that are owned by people of color are much more likely to employ other people of color in a wider variety of jobs, which has tremendous influence on all sorts of things but among them makes us all a little more economically secure in moments of crisis, right? Look what happened in the, at the beginning of the pandemic when you know hundreds of thousands of service industry workers lost their jobs at once, right? If you are deeply concentrated in one industry, it just makes you fundamentally vulnerable um, in ways that you know, have all kinds of implications. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about why it matters why the work that you're doing, I guess, in essence matters. What is it that people need to understand about why, say, access to capital matters? Why the black business terrain and its sort of overall well-being does, in fact, matter, even if you are not a business owner? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and can I make a comment also about yeah. the coalition piece, too? Because um, the alliance, at once GGRF and initial guidelines were released, we started working with other intermediary organizations to build a coalition. Mm -hmm. And so out of that, the Community Builders of Color Coalition was formed. And within four months, I wanna say, we had uh, about 18 organizations, all BIPOC-led, BIPOC-serving to join the coalition. And our, our sort of first order of business was GGRF, right? But now that we, we, which led to the establishment of the Justice Climate Fund and the application has been submitted. Um, and so now it's like this coalition that includes organizations like Inclusive, um, NowCab, Orwista, um, the National Bankers Association, uh, the Black Urban League, uh, Black Chamber, right? What's next? And when you think about the, the power of this coalition and, and the potential that it has to continue to leverage voices, leverage that experience in other areas. And so I feel like um, you're gonna see the coalition more active in this space now that we can kind of like wipe our brow from <laughs> the GGRF applications. But that's just a response to say that the, the coalition piece is <laughs> rising. People are coming together and realizing that we are gonna do more together. Uh, and so I think we'll see a lot more of that. Uh, but in terms of access to capital, oh my goodness. I mean, black owned businesses, you know, the, the decline rate amongst banks um, is incredible. I want to say it's like over 90, other than about 92% of applications that are submitted are denied, right? And what does that translate into? Uh, it means that black owned businesses are uh, more likely to bootstrap, right? That means we're going to use our credit card to finance the early stage of our business, which is going to hurt our credit so that when our business actually does grow, now we can't get a loan from a bank, right? And so it just creates this perpetual cycle. And so access to capital for black-led CDFIs is really an investment not just in black-owned businesses and in affordable housing that supports black communities, uh, but it's also an, an investment 
um, into startups, into established businesses to help them get from that early growth to being more stable, which includes or, or leads to uh, them hiring more people from that are um, within those communities. Uh, Black-led CDFIs tend to be located within the communities they serve and have a representation within their staff. That means we get products and services that are uh, relatable and culturally relevant. And so it all kind of leads to that, that cycle. But if we can't get the investments on the top, uh, because black-led CDFIs tend to be more locally focused, so they're gonna be, they're gonna serve a county, they're gonna serve a city, they may serve just a single state. Uh, it's harder for them to raise the dollars because they can't give those big headline, thousand jobs created, a thousand this, a thousand that. They can't give the big headlines, right? And so those large name, you know, foundations, they shy away from the smaller guys. And so through the Alliance, we started the Black Renaissance Fund to help eliminate that argument. And so now we can go after um, the bigger foundations and corporations and say an investment in the Black Renaissance Funds, we're gonna fragment that investment out to smaller CDFIs. So we're, we, we can do those loans to them for $250,000, which is you know small potatoes in their eyes, so to speak. But we can aggregate all of that. And so I think it really is about group economics at a, at a CDFI or a, you know, level uh, that we can see that begin to change. I think we have just a little bit of time to open the floor to maybe one or two questions um, I'm told. So uh, we will do that. Um, okay, we'll keep it as tight as possible. I guess as always, it's probably helpful if anybody has a question that they wanna ask. Yes, certainly. Go right ahead, your hand shot up first that I can see. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Cedric Baker. I'm with the McKnight Foundation um, in Minneapolis. So it's a private family foundation. And the reason I bring it up is because we were at the epicenter of the George Floyd murder. And so to your point around um, corporations and others making commitments and then backing away from it, we are definitely seeing that uh, in Minneapolis. However, one of the things that we are very concerned about is making sure, to your point around accountability, that we still see that move forward. Um, one of the things that we're doing at the McKnight Foundation is the Groundbreak Coalition, which is pulling a lot of uh, philanthropic organizations, corporate entities, um, governmental entities together to change the way capital is done at large scales. And we are feeling the chilling effect in many different ways, and so, my question is, what do we do? Because there is a very strong ground game from the other side, but it does not seem to be a very organized uh, response or offense. And so can you talk a little bit about what you are hearing and seeing around an, a very strategic offense in dealing with this chilling effect? Well, look, I'm, I'll talk a little bit of uh, defense, then offense. So. Uh, first and foremost, I think it's critical that philanthropy support key linchpin organizations like the Joint Center. Jessica, you're doing a phenomenal job. I'm just so proud of, <laughs> grateful for your leadership. And the coalition building is, is, is important uh, as, as well. I mean, I would say at the Lawyers Committee, we launched an effort that we call the Protecting and Advancing DEI Initiative, where we've recruited six law firms to provide advice to nonprofits. And part of why we did it is because a number of philanthropies came to us and said, we're worried about how our grantees are gonna fare, and their general counsels are worried about, can we give money to these people who are doing these race-targeted things? And we say, by and large, yes, you can. Don't give the money to the law firms, uh, to, you know, they're gonna charge you hundreds or a thousand dollars an hour, lift up nonprofit sales. So we are now working with a number of grantees and nonprofits, including some public charities, right? The offense game, I want to lift up the Government Alliance on Racial Equity, which has relationships with almost four dozen um, political subdivisions around the country, state, local, county. Uh, they also have relationship with 11,000 individuals who are not elected officials, sub-elected level, uh, often appointed civil servants, many of them some political appointees, 
who are trying to advance racial equity. They're trying to advance a economic initiatives, housing initiatives, reparations initiatives, and they are getting pushed back. So I don't know if you consider it an offense, but we cannot allow them to be swamped and silenced uh, and stumped down. We need to support those kinds of efforts as well. And of course, we're gonna have to sue some fools too, <laughs> right? Like, like, so, and I'm not gonna, I don't like writing checks I can't cash. I got some of my team in here, <laughs> Caleb and Isabella. So check this out. We defended UNC's admissions policy. We represented students as student inter defendant interveners in, the federal, in all the federal courts, including the Supreme Court. Now the UNC trustees who are rabidly conservative said, we're gonna do less than the Supreme Court has allowed. They're saying you can't talk about race on the application at all. Even though we defended UNC, maybe somebody's gonna have to sue UNC too if they don't actually get right with reality. So we have to do a lot of research, man. It's not just like file a lawsuit, this is wrong. The, mo the courts don't have the moral clarity that we have. So we need to actually support to develop strategies. Every philanthropy wants us all to coordinate. And they turn around and ask why you're not coordinated, because people fund us to do the work, not to coordinate. Fund the coordination just like you're doing with Groundbreak Coalition. As much as I would love to continue, no, no, it's okay. I, I just am being warned, you know, that we're gonna go so far over our time that we throw off the rest of the um, panels. So I will just, I wanted to say thank you all, honestly, for sharing so much um, in the way of valuable information um, and bringing a little bit of order and simplicity to a very complex set of issues. Um, and I think 